Welcome to our devotional study today. I invite you to take your Bible and go to the book of Titus. Yesterday we began to, or we laid the introduction, we began to look at the salutation of Paul and uh, Paul explaining his own ministry. We saw in verse 1 that Paul identifies himself as a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. So we want to look at the last part of that verse today. But before we do that, let's read once again Titus chapter 1 and verses 1 through 4. It says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. So as you come into these verses, we have seen here that uh, in verse 1 yesterday, Paul identified himself, as, a, as I said, as a servant of God. He identified himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he says, according to the faith of God's elect. And we, we looked at that a little bit yesterday. And we want to see that the result of that faith is godliness. Uh, notice it says in verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. Uh, the simple truth of the matter is this, that God's desire for me as a believer is godliness, that he is to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his will. That's his desire for me. As a Christian, God has predestined, he has predetermined that as a child of God, that he wants me um, to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to Romans chapter 4, Romans, or Romans chapter 8, rather. Romans chapter 8. The verse that everybody knows is verse 28, where it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And we're not going to take a lot of time in that verse today, but a lot of times people look at, at bad stuff in their life and they say, well, how is this good or how is that good? Well, the truth of the matter is they work together for good, but in the eyes of God, what is good is when, notice in the end of the, that verse, his purpose is attained. You see, many times we look at what is good or what isn't good according to our purpose. But this verse says that it's according to his purpose. You say, well, what is his purpose? Well, verse 29 of Romans 8 says, For whom he did for now, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So there we see that those whom God has saved, he has predetermined, he has predestined to be conformed to the image of of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God's desire in your life and in my life as a believer is godliness and godliness, true godliness in the life of a person will create, will produce rather good works. Keep in mind, we are not saved by our works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're not saved by works, but we are saved to do good works. Ephesians 2.10 says, for, but for we are his workmanship, creating in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So true godliness produces good works in our lives. Let's notice that in the book of Titus, how it develops. Titus chapter 1 and verse 6 says, if any be blameless. Notice there's that idea of being blameless. That's God's desires that we be blameless. He says, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. But it all begins with this idea of blamelessness. It produces good works in our lives. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 7, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. So there we see that once again, that God has saved us, that we he might produce good works in our lives. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14 says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people. That word peculiar does not mean odd. It simply means we are his possession. Remember, 
First uh, Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, What know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So that word peculiar means that we belong to him. And then Titus 2, 14 ends with zealous of good works, that we ought to be pursuing good works. We ought to be bubbling over with good works in our lives as believers. Notice in Titus chapter 3 how it teaches us that godliness produces good works. In verse 1, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Verse 5 of Titus 3, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Verse 8 of Titus 3, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that that which that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Verse 14 of Titus 3, And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. So do not, mis do not be mistaken. We are not saved by our good works. But as believers, good works ought to be the fruit of our lives. They ought to be the fruit of our salvation and of our surrender to God. Real salvation changes a person from a life of ungodliness to a life of godliness. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 12, it says, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So the result of this election, the result uh, of this faith in God, it produces godliness and good works in our lives as believers. And we'll see that even more as we move through this book of Titus. But then also I want you to notice Paul's hope in verse 2. It says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So Paul here talks about a hope that he has. And friends, hope in the word of God is something that is totally different than the word hope and how we use it today. The word hope almost means like a wish today. But hope in the Bible is a sure thing that is based on something that God has said. And Paul here talks about that hope that he has as a child of God. And he says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, notice this, promised before the world began. So Paul's hope was founded on the eternal purpose of God. He knew that God could not lie, and he knew that the plan of God will come to fruition. Reminded me back, I believe it's in, in Numbers chapter 23. I hope I'm taking you to the right verse. Numbers 23 and verse 19, it says this. It says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? And ha Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Friends, when God makes a promise, he keeps it. God is a God that keeps his word. God is not a man that he should lie. Um, remember what it said in Titus 1 and verse 2. It says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 talks about that. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3, let me take you there just for a moment. As we think about this eternal purpose of God and Paul's hope, it says in 1 Peter 1 Peter 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again, notice, unto a lively hope. Not a, it doesn't say a living hope necessarily. It says a lively hope. Friends, every lively thing is living, but not every living thing is lively. And Paul here says that he has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See what he's saying there? He's saying that hope that we have as a believer is a lively hope. It's a hope that motivates us to live for God. It's a hope that motivates us to live soberly, righteously, and godly, even in the midst of this wicked world that we live in. And oh, friends, let me ask you, do you have that hope today? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your sins have been forgiven? Do you understand that you have 
broken the law of God, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that there is absolutely nothing you can do to save yourself. There's nothing that you can do to be made right with God once again, but Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary, and he bled and died for your sin. And friends, that's the only place that hope is found. Do you know him? I'm not asking do you know about him. Do you know about him? And have you experienced the free pardon of sin that he brings? Have a great day.